what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Ted, it's so great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show, man. Welcome. Thank you, man. I'm I'm humbled and I'm just grateful to be here, Ryan. I really appreciate appreciate all the all the work you're doing, spreading the word out there and making people better. This is a different one because I've I mean I've admired you since we met and it's it's been more than a year now and 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 that the fact that you had an amazing application and wanted to become part of my my leadership circle. Um, I remember that day when you applied, man, I went home and told my wife Miranda and I said, this dude looks like I'm, I'm not going to be able to teach him anything. I'm just going to be sitting here learning from him the whole time. So I, I remember that was a pretty cool day when you applied. And obviously I wanted to have you in after we talked and it's cool that we've been able to build this ever since then. No doubt, man. Well, I've, I've stolen from you way more than you could have taken from me. So I appreciate you and all the lessons I've learned already. I love it, man. Well, I, I intend for this to be long term, but to get us started, man, I want to go to I love moments. I think you know that by now and, and stories, because the stories and the moments of our lives are where we can draw from and learn from. And you've um, worked in the NFL for a while, but there was a time earlier in your career when you worked for the Detroit Lions, I believe is 2014 or 15. And you guys did well, went to the playoffs, and then the following year you struggled. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through what happened midway through that season on to the end of the season when you're with the Lions? Yeah, absolutely. And it's really – that's a it's a fun time for me to visit now because when I took on the job with the Lions, I was blessed, and that's a whole nother story. But I got I got – I was fortunate to work for my hometown team. So – being able to do that, it was the first year after they went 0-16, climbed a couple of years. We were in the playoffs after a few years with Jim Schwartz. After a couple other down years, they fire Coach Schwartz. They hired Jim Caldwell. So Jim Caldwell's there, which is another crazy story. I, I have my first baby was born, and within six hours, I get a text message. Can you come in and interview with Coach Caldwell for your job? This is 2014 going into it. So I got the hospital wristbands on, Ryan. You know what it's like to have the first one. And I'm like, all right, honey, I'm going to come back with either good news or bad news. But we, we still have a healthy, beautiful baby. We're good. And got to maintain the job and got to work with Coach Caldwell. So 2014, Coach Caldwell's first year goes great. And a phenomenal man, phenomenal leader who I learned so much from. And then move on. We go to the playoffs that year. In my opinion, we got robbed in Dallas, which is a whole nother story. Once again, we can go down a rabbit hole. We lose in the first round of the playoffs. Okay. Okay. rebuild let's go probably overachieved that year from what we were supposed to do then move on to the next year 2015 we start one and seven so we're literally one and seven and we we're anticipated as one of the better contenders on the nfc side and we're, we're having a bad year we're having a rough year and it's that's a little bit of adversity you now in the grand scheme of things it's football it's not life and it's not no one's dying here but in our livelihoods and things like that there's a lot of people who, whose lives are affected by wins and losses so we go through the process. We're one and seven. We're about to leave to go to London. We had an international game. Before we even board the plane, we had three coaches who got fired literally the day we're about to leave. They had already checked their luggage. Some of them kept those luggage checks as a reminder, anything can happen in this league. It's a crazy league. So we fire our OC, our offensive line coach, and our assistant offensive line coach. Boom, boom, boom. We fly to London. OK, great. We're in London on the first day of our practice, which is a Wednesday. We're London local time and we're in, I think, I don't remember where. We're just outside of London, I think Watford. And we're practicing. Our equipment manager comes up and says, are you ready? We're going to fit you for your headset and everything else. I'm Timmy O'Neill's his name. I'm like, Timmy, what are you talking about? He said, you're going to be on the headset. You're helping with special teams this week with all the shuffling. I'm like, all right, let's ride. Let's Wait, go. What was your job at the time? So I was job? the assistant strength and conditioning coach. Okay. And this okay. is in the middle of it. I'm like, what's happening? And coming from our equipment guy, I'm like, okay, well, let's rock. Going to meetings. I'm going to special teams meetings, trying to soak in as much knowledge as I possibly can. So we fast forward through that game, have a horrible game that gets us to one and seven at that point. So we fly back and we have a bye week the following week. The day we land, they fire our president and our general manager. So in football terms, 
all hell is breaking loose and you're looking around, like everyone's getting fired. Okay, great. So we come back from the bye week, rested, refreshed. Now I'm an assistant coach. I'm helping with special teams. So on top of the other duties that I still have, it's not like somebody else took those on. So we're, we're continuing to do everything. And we were actually fortunate. We went seven and one. So the second half of that season, huge improvement, huge turn. Coach Caldwell did a great job. You talk about consistency and you talk about a level of an approach where the process doesn't change from one and seven to seven and one. Our process remained the same. And that's one of the greatest lessons I learned from Jim Caldwell. He is amazing at that. So we transition at the end of the year. We go through. We don't know if Coach Caldwell is getting fired. They eventually maintain him or retain him so coach Caldwell's still there and you're thinking all right great at this point we had had our second child so our second baby is I think three weeks old at the time same thing I get a phone call hey can you come into the office got it all right well it's going to be a good day or bad day we'll see what happens so kind of same thing that we just went through a couple years ago now we transition into that have the conversation we had hired a new general manager at that point the new general manager the head strength and conditioning coach at the time had worked for the organization, I think 15 years. So he's his office is right next door to me. They come down, they meet with him first. I can kind of hear what's going on. It doesn't go well. He gets let go. So then I'm, I'm next. They come in, Coach Caldwell and the general manager. And it was a great conversation as I'm sitting there and talking to him. I can kind of sense where it's going. And, you know, he gave me the reason, which I'll agree or disagree with the reason, but he said, because of the perception, we have to make it look like we're making sweeping changes. So we're going to let you go as well because you've been here so long with him. At that point, I'd been there seven years with a person who had been there for 15. So the media thinks, all right, they're 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 working, they're making big changes, blah, blah, blah. So I said, coach, thank you for the opportunity. The new GM, Bob Quinn, thank you for the opportunity. Great to meet you. First time I met him, I said, I appreciate it, everything. Say all the right things. In the back of my mind right now, I'm thinking, man, that's a horrible reason to fire somebody because they started off that conversation with, we can't find anyone to say a negative thing about you. We've heard you've done a great job here. Coach Caldwell obviously knows you have. So we go through that. You hit some some significant adversity. First time in my career in the NFL that I got fired, and it's from the hometown team. Then it hits the media. So all your friends and everyone's calling. And it, you that's adversity, you know, real-life adversity. Once again, no one's dying. But now I have a baby who's just turned two or about to turn two. We have our second child who's three weeks old at the time. And I'm like, all right, what are we going to do next? Wow. And especially it would, I mean, I can't imagine. What did you say to him when you're like, wait a second, you're firing me because of (laughs) optics, because of what it looks like to the media. Why do you care? What I, 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 I've never had that job. So maybe it's not my place to say that, but that blows my mind, man. Well, same thing. You know, I've never sat in the seat of a general manager and I have an incredible amount of respect for what they have to do. But just like you, Ryan, I've hired people and it's so hard for me to comprehend firing someone or letting them go when I've heard they do a great job and then saying, well, we have to make it look a certain way. That's really hard for me to comprehend. Yeah, but I guess that's part of that business, uh, depending on who the person is if they probably are more secure, I don't know this guy, but if they're probably more secure in themselves and maybe more established, I guess, they don't have to think about or worry about optics. But this this idea that you have to be so consumed and concerned with how something looks on the outside of the building, it it probably means like, well, there's better places for you to be. Mm-hmm. And... I, uh, you know, before this, I was watching the the viral video, which obviously you know is out of, of you because it's 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 of where you uh, you ended up at um at, at one point, and that's with Sean McVay being his his get back coach. You can Google that uh, for Google Ted and, and Sean McVay and the get back coach. The the video is is really funny. I remember watching it when it came out. I didn't realize that it was you actually no. until uh, preparing for this, but um I'm curious about that interview process because McVay is known as as a genius, as one of the greatest coaches already, uh, the lineage of his name and his his family being in the NFL. What was the process like to interview to work for him? That's another fun story. You know, the whole time I was actually in Miami at the time, so Detroit ends, got an opportunity to go to the Miami Dolphins with Adam Gase in his first year, and, and we go there. Within that staff, Vance Joseph had been hired to be the defensive coordinator. 
Vance's name was getting hot because we had immediate success in Miami and you know it's a copycat league all right they're they're doing it well they haven't been to the playoffs in a decade and they're doing so well what are they doing so Vance's name gets kind of hot on the interview circuit the whole time I think I'm going with Vance to Denver you know we go through this process Vance is like hey you're coming with me are you good I'm like Vance, I'll go with you. I'm good. So he gets the job. And within that cycle, obviously, then a lot of things have to happen for a new head coach. They got to hire a whole staff. There's a lot of moving parts. So he's like, just hang tight, just hang tight. You know, I'm working through the process. Got it. In the meantime, I start getting random phone calls from people, not even within the LA Rams organization, just random people. And they said, Hey, got a call from the Rams. I gave him your name. And I'm thinking, okay, cool. Great. You know, I'm under contract, so I can't talk directly to any teams. Vance is on staff. He can mention things like under, you know, under direct conversations. And I'm like, oh, cool. So hypotheticals, all sorts of things like that. Then I start getting calls and then the Dolphins call me. So Mike Tannenbaum, Adam Gase, our head coach, they they call me and they say, hey, we got a request from the L.A. Rams. They want to interview in the NFL. You have to go through a request process. So I say, OK, great. Mike Tannenbaum wants to block me because same thing. Mike says, well, this is a talented individual. Why do we let him out of the building? I still owe a lot to Adam Gase because Adam Gase said, you know what? This is a great opportunity for Ted and his family. We're going to allow him to explore it if that's what he wants. I said, coach, I love it. And, my, and Mike understood that too. And Mike's awesome. So Mike agreed to it at that point too. So we had this conversation. They said, go ahead, you can interview. So in the middle of all this, Sean is still in Washington, D.C. or in Virginia at that point. So he's actually there at the Reston Town Center and he's lining up interviews. They call me, hey, can you fly out here? Got it. So I fly from Miami up there to meet with him. And I'd never met the guy, never, never met Sean at this point, had heard great things, obviously had some mutual friends and said, hey, how is he? And you hear all the same things. It's all true, Ryan. The, the guy is an unbelievable leader. He's an unbelievable person. He's an unbelievable human being. He doesn't have children yet. He just got married. I can't wait for a person like this to have children because I know what kind of father he's going to be. Can't say enough great things about Sean McVay. He is a stud in all aspects of life. So within five minutes, I meet him. It just starts to roll, Ryan. We're literally, we're reading the same book at that time as Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leap Babin. So he's like, you're reading that too? I said, yeah, I'm reading it. Here's what I, so we start talking culture. We start talking practice schedules. We start talking international travel, how to, how to handle West Coast to East Coast travel, all these things that would rot. And it started with what would you do? And then it quickly transitioned. All right, what are we going to do if this comes up? What are we going to do with team discipline how are you going to handle fines how are we going to do this within five minutes this guy and me are on the same wavelength we are literally clicking on all cylinders and i'm like okay i i can absolutely feel it so within that night had the job and we go and, and we move forward and move the family to la at that point with my wife now you got all for that job that the, the, the day you interviewed the right that then. night yep went out to really? dinner Yep. Went out to dinner, had a great dinner, got off from the job. And Robin was, I think, eight and a half months pregnant at that point. Miami I said, hey, honey, saddle up again. We're going. Wow. Wow. So what's it like to be your wife? I mean, this is a crazy life that you live, man. And, and she's got to be along for the ride, willing to pick up and go. She's pregnant on flights. You're getting fired. You're getting hired. I mean, what's it like for her? I mean, honestly, Ryan, she's my hero. Like, I look at the stability. You want to talk about consistency? Not You know what it's like to get children ready for school. She does it with three kids every morning without my help because I've been at work for hours. So I look at what she's able to do. I couldn't do what I do without being able to rely on her to be able to do what she does. And she does it at such an elite level. She makes me better each and every day. She holds me accountable, but she's my partner. We go through every decision together. It's not like I'm taking a job and saying we're moving. It's Hey, how do you feel about this? And I trust her. I rely on her. And it's a team. It's a team effort. You talk about the greatest team. That's your family. So when we rely on each other and we have conversations like this, and it's kind of cool, our kids are getting older. They're starting to understand, you know, dad's job and things like that. But man, I couldn't do the job that she does, Ryan, because she is she's an absolute amazing warrior, what she does day in and day out. Did you so you're high school sweethearts, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Did you did sh did you know that this was going to be your path when you were in high school? Did you say I want to be if I'm not good enough to play in the NFL, which you and I are probably in the same position, both played in the Mid American Conference in college, had these grand illusions probably of thinking we were good enough to play in the NFL. I, obviously, I wasn't, and and you didn't make it, got hurt. 
what did 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 she know that? Did you know this? Like I'm gonna be in in professional sports some way, or what was the the conversations you had earlier on in your relationship? Yeah, no. <laughs> Short no. answer, no, absolutely not. When we when we looked at our life paths, I started out in physical therapy. So when I went to college, I said, all right, what do you want to? I knew I wanted to be active. I wanted to be around athletic movements, or I want to be around people trying to train to get better. And I went into a physical therapy, then I kind of got the sense after a semester, I'm like, okay, well, this is a different path than I can probably see myself sustaining or excelling and loving. And then at the same time, just like you know, Ryan, you're playing football, I got introduced to our strength and conditioning coach, Steve Murray, who's still at the University of Toledo. And I started to see this. And at that point, strength and conditioning, performance, it wasn't what it is now. Sports science didn't exist. There was, uh, there was all these things. It was very different. But I looked at this and said, that's an actual profession. You, you can be a full-time strength and conditioning coach at the college level. And at that point, I started to realize, yeah, probably at the NFL level. Within that, though, I'm still thinking, no, there's no grand you know, vision of, I want to be in the NFL in two years. I want to be at that point, just like you, I'm trying to be better as an athlete, as a student, as at that point, a boyfriend or Robin, I'm, how can I be better each and every day? And then one thing happened after another, and eventually I became a GA and then started working in it. I'm like, all right, this is definitely what I'm meant to do. And now I know what the next steps are. I think there's a lot to learn from your career path and and let's take it let's make it more broad beyond just professional sports for anybody who's trying to build a career. What because to start at the lowest of levels, I know which is what you had to do, right? You start making basically no money when you took a job and and you showed them you earned each of those promotions and I think the only way you truly earn it in that business, obviously you got to know people, we got to know people in every profession, that's part of it. But you didn't know Sean McVay, right? When you got that job, you met him and got hired the day you met him, right? So, and and I'm, I would imagine he did the necessary checks prior to the meeting to say, "Oh, Ted's a, Ted's a dude. Like he's a guy you probably want. Let me just make sure." What was it? What did you? What type of approach did you take to your career from the very beginning that you still have today? Obviously, you're in the middle of your prime. What did you take this, that, that enabled you to get promoted so fast? And take me back to the beginning, too, when, again, you signed up for these jobs with long hours, no money, all of that. I'd love to hear that part of it, too. Yeah, I think what helped me at that point is still what helps me today, Ryan. And it's I've always had this relentless desire, this relentless pursuit to be better every day. And that's my whole life is based on a process. Did I get better today? And at the end of the day, here's the beauty. I can go home, stare at myself in the mirror, and I have to be honest with myself. Everyone else, I could fool everyone else. Did you get better today? Sure, I got better today. You know who I'm not going to lie to? Myself. When I look at myself in the mirror every night, did you become better as a father, as a husband, as a Christian? Are you better as a performance coach? Did you help your team, your organization? Did you earn your money today? Did you earn your keep? I can be honest. So I've always had that. So going through the career trajectory, when I finished playing, got to the point, I said, okay, I definitely, I, I want to do this. I want to look into the performance aspect. Had a conversation with our college strength and conditioning coach, Steve Murray. He said, I want you to be a GA. I don't have a spot yet. You're going to have to wait a year. Great. Got it, coach. All right, I'm ready. So I actually took a high school job. I was going to take a full-time substitute teacher position and then coach football. So I went with my former head coach, who was up around the Dearborn, Michigan area at the time, just took a new job. So I said, great, I'm going to come up here. I'm going to work for you. We'll run the defense. I'm going to run. I'm going to begin a strength and conditioning program for you because I know this is where my passion is and this is what I'm going to do next. Did that for a full summer, basically a couple months, probably eight weeks total. Within that time, then a GA job opened up at my at Toledo. So someone had left. GA to, graduate assistant. Graduate assistant. Yep. So a position opened up and he's like, do you want it? I'm ready. I'll be in the car tomorrow morning. So drove down, took the opportunity. Great. Fast forward a year, had an opportunity to work with multiple sports. I get promoted after one year to a full-time position. Great opportunity. Obviously, I'm young. I'm 22 or 23 at the time. I can't remember. Now I'm in charge of all of our Olympic sports at the University of Toledo. We had 15 at the time. Football was our 16th, so I still helped. I still did everything with the football program. Now I get to work with 15 head coaches. Each of them has a staff. Each of them has a roster. You want to talk about leadership and learning and watching what works, what doesn't work. Amazing opportunity. Then, kind of out of nowhere, get an opportunity to take a part-time job with the Detroit Lions. Now, 
you get in and I'm looking at, all right, medical benefits is a full-time position. Robin at the time was a full-time teacher in the Toledo area at Whitmer High School. So now she's going there. We both have two full-time jobs. We think we're just murdering life and we're having a blast. And I'm like, hey, honey, uh, hometown team, I can get in the NFL. I have a thousand hours that I can max out. Not going to be much money. You good? Let's do it. Is this what you want to do? Yeah. All right. I'll ride with you. Let's go. Take that opportunity. And then after one year, it got promoted there. It worked out. But there was a time within that first year, I go to a part-time position. I maxed out my hours through the offseason, Ryan. I mean, you you know the grind of uh, football season. So offseason, I'm done with 1,000 hours in no time. So I had made, in effect, $10,000. That's all I was allowed to make. I had to sign paperwork basically saying, I will not sue you. I'm going to work for free. I'm willing to do this. So I didn't get a paycheck from training camp, from before training camp, all the way to February of that year. So to make ends meet. Were you had an hours restriction? It wasn't hours. It was something like that. But I think it was like a paid position oh. since it was part time. Anything else would have. So you hit it and you, you hit it like, let's keep going. A hundred percent because yeah. I'm well, you're not going to kick me out of the building. I can keep working. Great. Yeah. I got it. I pick yeah. up another high school job to make ends meet. So I'm driving at one point from Toledo, Ohio, Allen Park, Michigan, which is over an hour from Allen Park, Michigan to Ann Arbor, Michigan, about 45 minutes, then all the way back to Toledo. So I'm doing this every day. I'm getting up at three, three 30 in the morning and I'm cycling through. I don't even know what time I'm getting back before 10 ish, probably wake up, start over and do it all over again. And it, it was one of the funnest parts of my, my career journey, Ryan. I would, I love that part. I look really? back with fond memories just the grind and yeah. I, maybe i messed up but knowing that i can get up earlier i can accomplish more in a certain amount of hours than anyone that's the competition that drives me what, what, <laughs> let me play devil's advocate not just for that sake but but because like even me at points what about someone's like dude that's not a life man like what about your girlfriend or wife what about your what, what about like friends or balance or like what do you when you hear that what do you what do you think it's a great question. At that point, and how selfish were you before children, Ryan? I didn't know any better at that point. Now, if you put me in that exact scenario with three children like I have right now, I'm going to look at it completely different. Yeah, I'm going to try to point. maximize both sides. But right then, I, I'm with my high school sweethearts. We're still close to home. Our hometown's there. So she has her parents, her support system, her friends. I really didn't have to think about it at that time. If for lack of a better term, I was allowed to be selfish. And that probably allowed me to put in those hours and to do those things that help me get to where I am today. If it happened later, I don't know if I would have been able to do it. I can't answer that. I think when speaking with kind of recent college grads or um, I just, just um, spoke with one actually, who's a senior and I'm like, dude, before it's got a serious girlfriend, but before you have kids, mm -hmm. this is the time that you work like you work like that. And, and I know that's not popular to everyone to say that, but it it really is. I remember that too. I'm the exact same way, Ted, where would would I didn't my first job after getting done playing arena football was a sales job in a telephonic organization. And I never had a real job in my life. In the summers, like I would go to like a warehouse and work and paint the walls and do random stuff, but never it wasn't a real job. I get a real job and I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to dress a certain way. I gotta now I got to call cold call people. I had no idea, but I did. I I was curious to kind of learn from the others who I I could see the stack rankings they posted, and I would just go talk to those people who were who were doing it at a high level over years, and and luckily found a few mentors who would come in extra and help me. And and so the weekends were out, were working too when nobody else would work. And I think that's that's what the advice I would give. It's not the most popular advice, but is before you have kids and you can be a little bit selfish, that's when you kind of make hay. That's when you set the foundation that could set you up for later to have a bit more balance. It feels like that's what you did. Yeah, well, and I love what you said there. You've got to be allowed to grind. And that's the stage in life when you really do have to grind. What you're doing right now, if you're a 20-year-old, is going to help establish what you're able to do 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So do your habits of today align with your goals of tomorrow? That's one of my favorite things to say. Sean used to always say that. Do your habits of today align with your goals of tomorrow? If you're not grinding today, why do you expect to have more, not just tomorrow, next week, next month, but five years from now? What you do now is going to directly relate to that. And then you said you went and sought out the people that were successful. I love that. I'm making notes right now to where that's something 
I can continue to do. We can continue to do. That's what you do beautifully with this show. You think about what you're able to do. It's amazing. And I remember specifically, and I still do this to an extent. So this is part of the sick part of me. When we schedule vacations, if there's a training facility, if there's a place nearby where I can sneak away for an hour, Ryan, I'm going to try to do it. If we're out in San Diego, California, and I know we're by Exos, where I know they have a phenomenal movement efficiency set up, and they do a great job with training athletes. Hey, honey, do you mind if I go over here? with? Now I'll try to take the kids. If I can visit another NFL training facility or a college, now I can bring the children and they get to experience something cool. And I still get to kind of meet someone, talk shop a little bit, but better myself, sharpen my skills and my tools. So what's better than learning from other people? Nothing. You can learn from their mistakes for free without having to make them. I love that aspect. Me too, man. Uh, you then leave the Rams to go to your current job, um, or at least your current team. You've been promoted since already being hired by the Eagles. So you're with the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, as I told you prior to recording, I do like to make these evergreen. But at this at this time, you guys are undefeated. You're the best team in the NFL uh, at this point in the season. We're recording in uh, late October of 2022. And... Um, it's neat because you and I have been talking for more than a year, and 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 your team was good last year, but you weren't you you weren't the best team in the NFL, at least not by the record and by winning a Super Bowl, which is how this stuff usually gets measured. I'm I'm curious, man, the way that you approach this, because you're such a process guy versus a results based guy, because I think we're so aligned, and we were from the the first time we spoke that. The score will take care of itself if you if you dedicate and kind of marry the process. Can you walk me through your mindset now that you are a senior leader in the NFL for the number one team in the NFL? How you view your record being undefeated, as well as the daily process as what of what it takes to continue to get better each day? Yeah, I mean the only thing that matters right now, right? It's a Friday right now, so we'll play this Sunday. We have to go 1-0 and this week. And then really to narrow that scope down, we had to have a phenomenal day on Monday because we came off of a bye week. We had to have an even better Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We just finished our Friday preparation, and we had a great freaking Friday. We were locked in. The energy was right because every day we're preaching the same message. Last year there was a point where we were 2-5, and, we were two and five, and then we became a playoff team. And I've been team on teams like that. Our process hasn't changed since way back last year when we were 2-5. and five. Have we cleaned up things? Absolutely. But our process is still that. I just look back at today. What could I do better? That's what I'm going to go through today. Now, checklist. All right, next Friday, how do I get better on our Friday rhythm? Great. How do we improve that? If my process changes day by day based on our record, my process sucks. So if I only concern myself with the results, I'm never going to be very good at whatever I'm trying to be good at. If I get my process refined every single day and focus on making that better, then we're going to have an, we're going to have a chance to be ultimately really, really good in life, no matter what skill you're talking about. As a father, a parent, a worker, any job, that's how this world works. Your process will result in, in whatever you get at the end of the day, at the end of the year, at the end of a life. So what your process leads to is everything, everything. What, what are your goals, uh, whether for, the, for yourself, for your team, now that you're working uh, hand in hand with the, with the owner, with the general manager, with the head coach? I know you're a part of that, that group. You were one of the guys to help hire your current head coach. What, how do you guys set goals and, and how do you talk about goals? We don't talk about goals, really. If you really? look at it, we talk about our process. Now, if we're if we're in a conversation amongst each other, obviously our, our goal is to win the Super Bowl this year. The beauty is it's October 30th or 28th. We can't win the Super Bowl today. We can't win this week unless we win today. So once again, if you look at the top of the mountain and you step back and you're just staring up there, you're going to miss a step. So my favorite analogy is it's a step-by-step -step process. If I look up there, I'm going to inevitably fall. I'm going to bust my butt and I'm going to tumble down the stairs. And then I'm going to be at a lower point than I was to start with. So we really don't set these huge, extravagant team goals. We talk about winning our division because that gets you into the playoffs. Then we talk about one step at a time after that. But we can't win our division today. We're in week eight of the NFL season. We have to win this week. And once again, boiling it back down, looking at that narrow scope, zoom in, zoom out. You better zoom back in and you better get the team to be able to zoom back in on the process. What's today? What's tomorrow? We have to get better each day. How do you 
How do you measure if you won today or not? Great question. So for me personally, I look back going through a checklist. All right. For us, health plays a dividend. Did we have any avoidable injuries? So in the NFL, everything is predicated on injury when you're talking about performance and the health and well-being of the team. Did we have anything that was unavoidable? Did we have a non-contact ACL? Okay, if we did, we're going to take a deep dive and we're going to go through a whole taxonomy process about what we could have done better. And I'm talking about over the previous year, we're digging through piles of data, research, what we could have done differently with that athlete or what flag we may have missed. Now for us as a team, obviously at the end of the week, did we win? Did we get that check? Yes. But then within each unit, we have very specific isolated goals for our offense and it changes week to week. Once again, our process stays the same because we're working towards these goals, but it's going to interchange based on the defensive scheme that we're playing against, based on personnel, based on a lot of variables. Our defense is the same thing. And then our special teams unit is the exact same thing. So we have these goals. And then ultimately on each of those charts, each of those sheets, did we win the football game? That's absolutely one of the goals. We work in professional sports. We have to win. That is one of our ultimate goals. But if we skip processes and we skip steps and we have zero check marks all the way down, I guarantee you the place where it says win is not going to have a check mark if we missed all the other ones. In uh, college, I remember we got a grade on every single rep mm -hmm. of practice every single play in practice and obviously every single play in the games, a, a plus, a minus, a double plus, a double minus. And then we'd get a score on how we performed. And I remember liking that. I liked knowing that each individual thing I was going to do in the drill or the seven on seven or the team periods was carefully watched and we would watch it afterwards. The coaches would watch it first, then we'd watch it with them. And, and graded as well as our games. And you could, you could then focus on one, each play and each day. Uh, do you have a grading system or how do you do that with players? Since you're not the position coach, you're, you're, you're in charge of basically the, the team in a sense of their, their performance. How do you guys go about doing that? We actually do the same exact thing. Every player, really? every rep is getting graded specifically Here's the interesting part. Our practice squad probably has the most detailed grading from every single rep being just combed through with a comb because we look at every rep for them as ultra important because if a guy goes down, who's next up? Are they ready? So we grade effort. We grade performance. Are they making elite level plays? And it's based on a grading system. So for us, we look at those plays and ultimately, can we rely on? Can we trust? Is this player ready to step in and fulfill a role if they're called upon? And then obviously our starters, they're still getting graded. Every play is getting graded. So when we go through that process, the coaches are watching film, they're breaking it down every day. And then the same thing, then the players come back, they provide that to them. Hey, here's where you are. Here's where you messed up. Here's where you did great. Continue to build on that. And then let's fix the other parts. So we go through that. It's, it's a monotonous process. As you know, with sports, it's monotonous. But for me, I look at that more as consistency. You have to be consistent in your process. And if something does become monotonous, all right, is it time to change? Is it time to adapt? Is it time to evolve? That's where you have to ultimately assess yourself and say, are we doing what's right right now? Did it work last year? That doesn't matter. Is it right for our team right now? One of the commonalities, Ted, that I've found among the greatest players I've played against, the ones who really showed up on game day, is one, they showed up every day. Mm -hmm. But another element to, to the way that they approached their craft was they loved being coached. Mm -hmm. In fact, they would get mad if they weren't being coached and coached hard. And um, I think I think this is a transferable skill. This is transferable to all industries, not just sports, of people who say, like, I want the feedback. I crave the feedback. I need the feedback because I want to get better. Do you have some examples on your current team of guys who exhibit that quality of they, they so badly want, need, and, and have to be coached hard? Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you bring this up too, Ryan, because the cool thing is part of our foundation. What is an eagle? 
Part of that criteria is your coachability. Are you coachable? Because that's something, if you're not coachable, we're probably not going to draft you. We're probably not going to bring you into our organization. You have to be coachable, but you want to be, you have to be wanting to be coached. Jalen Hurts literally is the first guy that popped into my head as you were talking about that. He literally gets pissed off if you will not coach him on everything. Tell me what I'm doing. I don't care what I'm doing right. I'll know when I'm doing something right. You better tell me when I do something wrong. So a couple of weeks ago, Jalen did something not wrong, anything else. I went up to him. I said, hey, man, you talk about the standard is the standard. That's one of his best sayings. And he leads by example. He leads verbally. He's amazing. He's a coach's kid. And I said, hey, your standard sucks today. You know what he did? He turned that shit around the next day, Ryan, and he was even more on fire the next week. And I've just seen him progress through the time here. There's guys, I mean, Brandon Graham comes to mind. You look at all of our guys. We have so many elite guys on our team. I'm thinking back when I was with Calvin Johnson, he literally personified the same thing. And Dominican Sue, Aaron Donald, Matthew Stafford. I've been with all these players throughout my career, and literally I could name almost every guy on our team currently. Those are the players that ultimately have Hall of Fame caliber careers, they win championships, and they are the ones that continue to strive and drive themselves to get better even after they win championships, even after the personal accolades. Those things don't matter because if you're looking at those things, you're looking at the results. These guys are process-oriented, and that's what's led them to that level of success. What do you – and we love those players. We love those people who work at our companies, who work on our teams. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately – that is not necessarily the norm. It's, it's probably more the norm this year for your team. The results probably uh, are, are, are leading to that. But how do you handle it when you find someone who maybe is really talented, really gifted, but maybe doesn't love being coached or, or God, I hate to say it, doesn't love the grind or to work at it, to make themselves better? How do you approach, because this definitely happens in the corporate world, right? Sure. How do you approach somebody like that? It, it all comes back to what's your why? You know, what are you motivated by? And our guys are just like anyone else. You're motivated by different things. And unfortunately, yeah, there's guys on our team that are more motivated by the things that football can give them than by the act of practicing, preparing, and training for the level of football. There are those guys like Jalen that literally love the process. But there are the other guys that want the next contract. They're motivated by money. There's other guys that are motivated by the fame, the recognition. There's nothing wrong with that. So for me, Ryan, when I look at it, number one, my first rule is don't get mad at the player because they're being who they are. They're being who God created them to be. I'm never going to fault someone. It's not my job to judge you. If you're motivated, motivated by money, God bless you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring you in, and then I'm going to try to trigger key words. When we're training in the middle of the offseason, I know you don't want to be there because it's voluntary, and I know you'd just rather be in Vegas partying or doing something else way more fun than grinding with us. I'm going to bring up, hey, man, you, you better get strong because that bag of money you're going to be carrying around, your second contract, you're going to need all the muscle you can get. <laughs> Bringing them back to the why. Because if you can tug on those heartstrings, if you can bring them back to their personal drive or their personal fire, Ben Newman talks about this. What's your burn? What makes that athlete focus? And what makes that athlete literally want to get better each and every day? If it's money, great. I'm going to draw on that. And we're going to make sure I'm going to try to get you as much money as possible by pushing you. So you got to find out what their why is. How much of, of your I, – uh, I texted Bobby Carpenter, uh, one of your former players, uh, right before this, and I said, hey, what's something about Ted that I can talk to him about that I uh, won't find on the internet because, you know, I do like a deep dive. And he's like, oh. So, first of all, I love Bobby. He, my brother played in college with him. I hung out with him quite a bit in college and just was with him a week ago. Um, in, in, but he is notoriously very critical of people, especially coaches, if they're not good. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories. And so I was wondering, I'm like, I wonder what he's going to say. Like, I love Ted, but th there's a chance Bobby doesn't. And he goes, oh, my God, I love that dude. Love I just can't get over the energy he brings, the juice he brings to each day, and that's contagious. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's really cool. And it's true. I think that's true. I, I sense that from you in our leadership circle meetings as well as every time we've interacted. Is that something that's just a part of you? Did you get inspired to be this way from others, a combination of all? What do you think that is in you that, that you bring so much juice to whether it's a Zoom call with people who aren't a part of the NFL, which is our group, or when you are coaching your players? 
Yeah. Once again, Ryan, I think I drink a lot of coffee. That's part of it. But <laughs> for me, uh, it's that relentless pursuit of being better. You know, yeah. for me, if I can draw something out, which I can in every conversation, I'm going to be so in tuned into that because I'm never going to miss an opportunity to get better. Never going to miss a rep. So if I'm having a deep dive with you and we're talking about all things leadership, I'm going to take away so much from that conversation. If you can't get excited about making yourself better, which is all we're meant to do on earth, then how do you wake up in the morning and go through life? For me, it's all about what can I do? What can I draw out of these athletes? But then you said a word right there. It was inspire. And there's a, I just read a great book by uh, Stephen M. R. Covey. We actually have uh, Britton Covey on our team, the grandson of Stephen Covey. So the family has obviously done a tremendous job with pushing these, but the name of the book is trust and inspire. And in it, he talks about motivation versus inspiration. Motivation is great. So for me, I always used to think that this was motivation. I read this book and I started thinking, man, I would rather, I how much more would I be benefiting others and myself if I could get to the point where I inspire? So how do you inspire with repetition, with consistency? I can motivate somebody through a, a five minute talk. If I go talk to a high school football game, I'll get them motivated. But what can I do to inspire people? I can be who I am each and every day consistently over time. And then they see that there's no breakdown. There's no chink. There's no loss. There's no letdown. That should inspire people to see, okay, well, I can, I can do that. Shoot. All right. I can wake up every day early and go work out before work starts. I can do those things. So if I don't pour in my passion to our players who go through a grind of a season, Ryan, you know what the college season's like, and you know, through your brother and through a lot of other people, the NFL season is a grind. And then I got to bring these guys in and we have to do more uncomfortable things. Well, if I don't have energy, I shouldn't be in there because my job is to get those guys to the point where they can better themselves, protect themselves, go make money if that's their goal for them and their family or win championships. Whatever it is, my job is to make sure I better bring the energy every single day consistently. You know why consistency, while not a sexy term, is so important? Because I think consistency is the foundation of trust. Mm. If your guys trust you because they know you're going to be there, they not only are you going to be there, but you're going to be there with this type of energy and desire. And when you show up every day, and I, I this is a big reason why I try – and consistency is one of my four core values because I realize how important trust is. And it's created, I think, a lot of trust with my audience because they know every Monday the email is coming for 337 consecutive weeks. Every every Sunday night at 7, a new podcast is coming for seven and a half plus years, never missing no matter what, despite travel, sickness, COVID, you name it, we're not missing. Like that thing builds trust. And I, I would imagine the guys around you, that's got to be a big thing they say about you too. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to steal that, first of all, because I always say consistency is the truest measurement of performance. Consistency is the foundation of trust. That is what that's empowering, because ultimately, what do we have without trust? If I can't get an athlete to trust me, why would I ever expect them to do the things that I'm asking them to do that are uncomfortable, to go home, do additional recovery modalities that are going to help their bodies turn over so that they can come back better the next day? If I don't establish trust, I have no chance, nor should I. And then I always tell guys this, don't trust me right away. Don't trust me. You can get burned in this life. And I know you, you feel opposite. I feel I see why you say that, Ryan. But for me personally, I'm like, don't trust me. I'll give my trust away before I expect somebody to give me their trust. As weird as that is. I agree I just, with that. No, I, I agree with you. That's I, how I'm, I feel. I'm willing to lead and get, I'm, I'm willing to trust you prior to you trusting me because I understand you your life experiences are different than mine. And yeah. maybe you've been burned more than I have. Yeah. This happens with relationships at time, and I understand it. Trust. Now, you don't have to do that with me. Right. I'm, you got it. You got it. Now, the problem, though, Ted, I'm sure this happened with you, too. If you break it, mm. if you do, it's really hard. It's really tough because you got it without earning it. And that's the way I'd rather live. With that said, though, that's why I feel like, you know, I had this uh, this this uh, kind of party uh, a, a couple weeks ago as an appreciation event for uh, people who listen to the show. It was in Dayton, so it was local. Uh, Out-of-town people, it was tough for them to come. But anyways, it's a, like a concert. And one of the guys who came, he's also actually a member of my other leadership circle, he came and he's one of my good friends named Parker Mays. Parker said, you know what? I noticed when I go to, you, go to your events, the, the, the thing that I love the most is like every person I meet is just such 
a good guy or girl, like trusting, they're thoughtful, they're curious, they're just really high character people. And that was like the greatest compliment I could ever receive. And I was like that, I think that starts because of that, of the trust, because of like leading and having a relationship with that. Because when you lead with that, people usually will try hard to keep it. They'll work really hard to maintain it because they already have it. And so that's why I like to lead with it. But with that said, like you, I'm okay with it if you don't if you don't like I, I'm okay that if, if if I have to earn it. Now, obviously we're getting into gray areas here where, where there are times it's like, okay, at some point we gotta go. But but I but I'm with you on that, I think. I think we're more aligned. Yeah, I like that. And I agree with you too. You you you're a magnet for the people that typically you want to be around. And if you're willing to give that trust out, yeah. and then those people are also willing to work for it then you're going to have something really special bond over time because then you haven't even been vulnerable yet. Imagine when you show some vulnerability, how much more strong that trust is going to get and grow. So I, yeah, we're speaking the same language. I absolutely agree with you. Give it away, but I expect to earn it in return. What were your parents like? What was your upbringing like? Really, man, I'm blessed. Parents are still around. They're high school sweethearts, still married. So wow. unbelievable. But small town, really rural upbringing. My dad woke up at 2.30 in the morning every day for his job in downtown Detroit, would drive the hour-ish from our house. He would still come home, and I'd be there, little ener energy bunny. Dad, you want to play catch? You want to play catch? Let's go out. And, let's... and he would do it every day. I have such more of an appreciation for him now, Ryan, because when I get home, I'm just ready to go to bed. But <laughs> you got to go. You got to go. And he always did it, man. So he taught me a lot. My mom she is the she's the woman who if you tell her she can't do something because she's a woman she's 100 gonna do it she's driven in demolition derbies in our county fair what? she hunts and fishes right i can't i can't make up stuff and that there's a thousand other things i could tell but she is someone she makes me respect women in a different manner because i was raised by such a strong woman and then my dad still had these awesome qualities so I am blessed. I'm spoiled just to be able to call them my parents, Brenda and Kevin. They, I, I owe everything to them because they're amazing. Where where are they? Are they close by? They're, they're in Michigan. So for okay. us, honestly, a big part of the move was to get closer. It's not close, but they can drive here in about eight hours and they can see our kids. And that's that was a big draw making the decision to leave L.A. to come here. That was a big part of it. What do they think of their son having a job like you've got the head of player performance for these for the for the for the Philadelphia Eagles? They they tell me they're proud, man. And it's something, you know, it, it obviously makes me proud that they're proud and they're happy. But I remember we opened up in Detroit this year and we had a game and I have a buddy who unfortunately passed away 10 years ago. So he was super young before 30 passed away. He has a 12 year old son and I haven't seen his son in years. Obviously, I've been I've been on the road and moved. You know, we live in different areas. And I was able, I brought them down on the sideline in pregame, got to see my buddy's parents. And man, it was emotional. Gave them a big hug and then being able to give the kid a hug. My parents were also there. They're friends with my buddy's parents. So being able to experience that and bring them down on the field where I know it was an emotional thing for them, but they were so thankful. And then being able to get to talk to my buddy's son and say, I expect you to grow up like a good man, like your father was. And being able to have that moment, man, there's... There's moments in life, Ryan, where you'll never forget. I'll never forget that moment because I saw not just how proud my parents were, but to be able to share that experience with someone who had obviously gone through some tragedy and some personal adversity and being able to have that experience is there's no price tag that you can put on that. Mm. One of the parts of your career that I found to be really cool that we've talked about is you were um, in the group of people interviewing when you had a head coaching uh, opening for the team. And I, I am fascinated by the hiring process, especially for huge jobs like the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. Can you, uh, I don't know how many names you could name or how it went, but, but as much as you can, walk me through what that process was like, what questions were asked, who stood out, why did they stand out, like the, the combination of questions and answers. I would have loved to have been in that room. What was that like? Uh, man, I, I felt like I was stealing knowledge by the second. If there was a meter ticking, Ryan, I mean, it was literally going a thousand miles an hour. When you talk about the greatest football minds in the world, we got to interview. It was either nine or 10 of them in total. And we got to sit down with everyone and the topics range from their personal upbringing, what their why was. Why do you want to be a coach? Why do you want to be the head coach? Why do you want to be an effective CEO of an organization? 
you know, what made you? A lot of it was their parents. They came from coaching backgrounds like Josh McDaniels and Nick Sirianni, who we ultimately hired. His dad was a huge influencer. His dad comes around the building all the time. You can see how, how much of an influence because he was a coach for, I think, over 40 years at Nick's high school. And his brother's a coach at a smaller college. So you look at this and how it happens. They just caught the bug. But topic ranges from culture to how you handle discipline to offensive, defensive, special team schemes to staff development to player development. How are we going to pour into these athletes? Are you going to lead by discipline? Are you going to lead by love? And hearing the dramatically different interview process from each individual candidate, it, each one was so unique that I can't even describe the intricate details of what every, every single head coach candidate ticks to a different beat. So for me, it's getting into the nitty gritty details, talking about they're one of my questions that I love to ask them. What is your personal daily routine? What's your process? What's important to you? Do you get up in the morning? Do you work out? Do you work out at night? That was one of the things going back to Sean McVay, me and Sean and I worked out in the morning and it was early. It was like four in the morning. We would work out every single morning and it wasn't long. It was 15 to 20 minutes, but that was our daily digest of the team. What's going on, what the culture's like, what, who do we need to love up? Who do we need to push harder? And Getting to understand, do you have a process? Because to be a successful head coach, if you don't have a daily process, if you don't have a routine, you're probably not going to be very successful because it's such a grind. So trying to figure out what makes them tick, I think figuring out their why and then understanding what are your values. The guys that had great cultures like Nick, like Coach Sirianni, he had five core values ready to roll. And it was connect, compete, accountability, football IQ, fundamentals. So then we broke down each one. All right, how are we going to live this? But how are we going to make the players understand that this is important so that they start to live it? Well, we're going to demonstrate it day by day. We compete in every way. Coaches compete against coaches, players versus players, players versus coaches. That's how we brought competition in, connecting. You have to do team events. You have to get together. You can't put connect up on the wall throughout our facility and then not actually promote practices to connect. Guys, go to the basketball game together. Go to the Phillies game. They're in the World Series. Go enjoy that. Go have fun. That's how you connect. You don't just put it up on the wall. We talk through the process of how you're actually going to instill these things and live them out and let them breathe and permeate throughout our organization. What were those five values again? Connect, compete, accountability, football IQ, and fundamentals. Wow, okay. So you have all these great candidates. He gets chosen. How, how, what, what put, put it over edge to choose him? You know, it's a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, Ryan, storytelling. You know, that was one of the things, man, he, Coach Sirianni is phenomenal at telling a story. Really? And he, so, he, real quick, remember, I mean, obviously you remember, I remember his first press conference. It was a, it was a disaster. <laughs> like, I remember thinking the Eagles are going to lose every game. <laughs> Their coach, he just, I don't know what happened during it. And I, he's obviously rebounded and now he'll probably win coach of the year this year. But but it, 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 it was not good. So I, I'm wondering what you were thinking that day. Like, oh, my God, did we mess up? Did we make a mistake? Or what were you thinking from making him, choosing him, and then him kind of blowing the first press conference? You know what's funny? And this is what makes him him. Accountability being one of our five core values. You know what Nick did when that happened? He owned it, right? He literally played that clip in front of the whole team the first day. He said, here's what everyone day? thinks of me. First day, plays it, plays the clip. He's like, guys, this is what people think of me. It's okay. Do you know what I did the next day? I went back to the process. I met with our PR coordinator. I literally said, how can I get better? What do I need to do? And then he did it. So don't yeah. just tell me. People see way better than they hear. We watched him, and he progressively got better. And you look at him now, he kills it. In the media, he can joke with the guys, with the, with the press conference. He, he has done such a tremendous job of living out the value of accountability through that process. But he does that in every way, each and every day. And I think that example is a great one because if you look at the first one, everyone thought that. I get it. In the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, that's one bad one. And we're in the Philly – Philadelphia media, which obviously is not a gentle media to, to live in. And they crushed them and everyone worldwide national media was crushing them. So a lot of people were thinking similar to you, but in the back of my mind, knowing him and watching him, he had a true, 
he had a trueness about him where you could see the empathy within him. You could see coaching from a loving standpoint, but still holding players accountable through his storytelling of how he told us he handled certain situations. When you hear someone talk passionately and you can feel that radiate off them, and then you know it's authentic because you can talk to the players and you do this background research, then you know and you put that trust in. Same thing. All right, we're going to instill trust. Because you bomb one press conference doesn't mean that we're just going to turn you off. If you throw one interception as a quarterback, we're not going to ultimately pull you out after that first throw. We're going to give you another chance. We trust you. We've been through this together. Let's just give them a chance to go through the process and work through this. You mentioned Jalen Hurts a few times, and obviously I'm I'm biased towards quarterbacks. Um, and I remember he's gone through some adversity in his career. There's been doubt. He's got, he got benched in college when his team went on to win a championship and it had to be such a bittersweet, weird feeling of winning a title but getting benched. I, I think that would be so hard. And he was doubted in Philadelphia. Uh, will he be the guy? Will he be the guy? Now he's MVP candidate and and potentially will win that depending on how the rest of the year goes. What is it about him and his leadership style that seems to work so well now? Because I don't know if it always did. And the performance wasn't always what it was now. So it's obvious he's gotten better. Uh, what is it about him that's so special? You know, it's funny, Ryan. We've had these same conversations like we're talking about. I've asked him these questions. How, how have you changed? He's like, I haven't changed. My standard's always been this. He said, my process hasn't changed. He said, maybe the results have changed because of all these other things have worked out. He said, but if I don't go back to the drawing board and continue to work, relentlessly on my craft, how can I expect to be better? And one of the stories, I remember this from – going through the evaluation process for the draft that year. One of the stories that I absolutely loved about Jalen, talking to the staff back at Alabama at the time, and they told me about the day after he got benched. So you look at the national media, everyone's crushing this kid who at that point, he was probably 19, 20 years old. And they're crushing him, saying, you're no good. You know, it's Tua, it's this, it's that. And I said, okay, tell me about that. And they said, well, the next day we had a workout. We're in the room and we have a training session. There's a freshman goofing off. And who shuts down the lift, who stops everything and tells them that it's not the standard at Alabama? It's Jalen. This is a kid that's going through ultimately, at that point, maybe the worst adversity he's went through, certainly from a sports career. And he, in the back of his mind, said, that's not the standard and I'm not going to allow it. He stopped the lift, pulled the freshman under his wing, said, that's not how we do things here. This is Bama. There's a standard. And then took that kid under his wing. That alone, you talk about leadership, Ryan, right when I heard that, I said, this kid's got it. How do you understand that at 19 years old? Well, he's a coach's kid. He's been raised right, but he holds himself to a personal standard that is almost untouchable. And that's what makes him drive for greatness every single day. He's kind of quiet, it seems, though. I saw him on the Manning cast and he wasn't he didn't have a big personality on that. And uh, and I see him in interviews like he's pretty kind of. I don't know if he's introverted or not, but but seems like a little different in that regard. Maybe you see a different side. I'm sure you do, but 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 I think that that also for those who aren't the 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 loud ones or the super talkative ones that they may they may they may be inspired by that style. Like, am I accurate there, or, or what's what's he like? Yeah, I would say the one word I would use: stoic. He is stoic, stoic man. Yeah, it, he remind Jim Caldwell was very stoic. Yeah. Never had to raise his voice, anything. Now, but Jalen has that in him. If there's a time when he goes through, you know, to break the team down in a certain situation and he starts talking, you're like, holy cow. All right, this kid thinks like a coach. And he uh, starts saying the right things. He has that within him. He draws it out when it's necessary in his mind. So otherwise, he's just going to remain cool, calm, collected. He's going to be as consistent as possible every single day. And that's where that stoicism comes in because there are very different personality types. He has a very unique one. He, he's laid back, which I think helps him. And he can take on the coaching and doesn't respond with an emotional standpoint. Where most humans, if you coach me hard, I'm going to respond. He wants that and he begs for it. Like you talked about, Ryan, you give him the coaching. He's like, all right, I got you. And he goes on to the next, he fixes it right then. It's well, awesome. I think one of the biggest things I always remember, they're like, what do you listen to in the locker room for a game? And I would listen to the music that would be calming mm -hmm. because it was not a problem to be amped up. But as a quarterback, I think stoicism is important because amidst the chaos, 
and the bodies flying around and the big guys trying to get you and managing the huddle in between plays, perhaps when you're always fighting adversity, you got sacked and get picked off, something bad happens, you got to respond immediately. You got to have complete belief in the play call as you're as you're telling your teammates this is what we're about to go do. That stoicism, I think, is so important in that position that you can then take on. I had Brady Quinn on, and Brady and I talked a lot about this, the fact that that going through that as a quarterback can help you, and that's why you see quarterbacks go on beyond the football field, whether they're coaching or they're executives or they're, they're doing big things because they're, they're, they're able to remain calm amongst all of the chaos and that's leadership that's life that happens out in all different areas uh, of the world so I, I think it's a it's good things for us to kind of draw from even if you haven't played quarterback even if you haven't done it you can still draw and learn from that no question it's calmness in the storm and that, yeah. that's stoicism by definition you look at how do you handle each situation if the situation is never bigger than you you're going to be successful and you're not only going to be successful, you're going to instill confidence in those surrounding you in a, a sports team. That is the ultimate best thing that you can do. You instill confidence in the rest of the team. Everyone's going to elevate their level of play without getting too emotional, too high, too low. It's bad on both ends for him. Cool, calm, collected, and you stay stoic and you know that the moment's not bigger than you. Then I have ultimate confidence. We're going to go dominate and we're going to conquer that moment. It's the ultimate. One of the ultimate measures of leadership is that, you help others perform at a level higher than maybe they even thought they were capable of. And because of your presence, because of the way that you handle yourself, the way that you show up each day, that's what the, the, the best of the best leaders find a way to do. Whether they're playing, they're coaching, or they're leading a business, they make others better. They help others perform at a higher level than they thought they were capable of. And that's why people say, ah, oh, I want to work with Ted. Like I got to be around that. That's the type of thing that I think is, is, is huge. Ted, one more question for you, man. When you, when you're, uh, I could talk to you all day, but when you're, um, um, I know you're in the middle of game week though. When, when you talk to people who are a bit earlier in their career, what you do, you got a lot of young guys uh, who are right out of college um, as well as those who aren't playing in the NFL, because I know a lot of people come to you for, for advice. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you give to that person maybe in their early to mid-20s? Man, first, develop an incredible routine. Develop consistent patterns that are going to help you get better every single day. Your goal should be to be better tomorrow than you were today and so on and so forth. Connect to those. You talk about this great, Ryan. You always do a beautiful job of explaining this. Your who is so important. Surround yourself with people that are going to elevate you. So if you need to reach out, if you're in the performance profession, reach out to me. Reach out to whoever's in the profession or in a seat that you want to be in. Surround yourself with those people. Beat down doors. Be relentless in your pursuit to connect with those people. And then ultimately, make sure that your personal process is in align with whatever your goals are. Do your habits of today align with your goals of tomorrow? Well, if you're sitting here and you tell me you want to be a multimillionaire, but you have zero money in the bank and you're 20, you should be able to save a little bit. All right, you have zero today. What are you going to save in the next month, in the next week? Setting those minor goals, those small step stones that are going to help you ultimately accomplish what you need to get. But more than anything, establish your routine and be absolutely relentless. If you are relentless, no one will ever be able to stand in your way. I always love saying, if you fear failure, you're probably going to fail. If you attack success, you will be unstoppable. If you attack mm -hmm. it with a relentless pursuit, you will be unstoppable. Nothing can get in your way. I love it. I forgot one more thing. So you sent me this picture of Incline in Colorado Springs. It made mm -hmm. me want to book a flight to go out there. <laughs> I've never been to this place. So uh, what, what, talk to me, walk me through what, what, what this picture is of incline in Colorado Springs. And it looks like a bunch of steps going straight up. Yeah, it is. I th it's almost a 3000, uh, step climb ride. So you're in obviously Colorado Springs. So I think you start out at 7,000 feet of altitude and you eventually get to just shy of 10,000. So it, it's a steep climb and world Olympians do this in 30 minutes. My time, the, the first time I did this was like 35, 36 minutes. They're like, that's pretty good. It's like, all right, but I want to do better. I was pissed off that I didn't do 30 or sub 30. Now, I'm not an Olympian. I'm just delusional. So for me though, what that stands for 
the story leading into that, we were in Colorado Springs because we were acclimating to altitude because on our schedule that year, we were supposed to go to Mexico City. We were scheduled. I was in L.A. at the time with the Rams. We were going to play the Kansas City Chiefs. And this was a huge game. We were we weren't undefeated, but we were probably like eight and one, nine and one. I actually have a game ball up there from this game. And I'll, I'll get to why the game was really cool and important. And KC was the favorites in the AFC. Pat Mahomes is balling out. And those guys are just going crazy. So we go. Cool. Rewind a week. We're in the middle of California wildfire season, which is not fun to live in California during. So we actually had to move our previous game. We were playing the Seattle Seahawks. We had to move out of our facility on Friday of that week. We moved into a team hotel downtown. They brought all of our families down, basically got evacuated. The wildfires were getting close to our facility. So we miss a Friday day of practice. I'm on the phone with Sean. How are we going to schedule this? We'll do this on Saturday at USC's campus. The air quality was good down there. So we change our whole plans. On that Monday, we were scheduled to fly to Colorado Springs because the next week was our Mexico game. So we play the game in Seattle or against Seattle at home, excuse me. And we play, we win. I think that was actually the game that they filmed the get back video as I think about it, which is hilarious. So we get out of that. All right, Monday, we're going back. The fires are still going on. They've kind of calmed down around our area. So we're able to sleep at home with our families. Within that night, I want to say 50 members of our organization, players, staff members included, get evacuated overnight and we're still supposed to fly out. All right, what are we going to do? Well, everyone, the organization did a phenomenal job. Stan Kroenke and everybody at that organization can't speak highly enough of them because they sent families, they bought hotel rooms. They did all this for the families to make sure that they were safe as we were getting ready to leave. So they take care of us. We fly to Colorado. As we're in Colorado, we're sitting there as someone's at the door. As we're sitting there, we go through the flight land fires have gotten worse. We're like, okay, what are we going to do? They get to the point where they actually get another plane for our families. So our families fly to Colorado to meet us. Once again, the Rams said, whatever the cost is, we'll eat it. They fly meet us in Colorado Springs. We're in Colorado. Our families are here. We're in the middle of this wildfire season. That's really destructive. It was the most deadly wildfire season at the time in the state of California. In the middle of that week prior, I skipped this part. There was a mass shooting in probably within three miles of our facility. My wife and a bunch of the other coaches' wives were actually at dinner that night. I didn't know where they were, but they were right by where this place happened. It happened at kind of a country bar and several casualties, very, very unfortunate. A police officer died. It was a sad time. And then the fires hit and we're going through this process. So there's a lot going on. So the adversity going through that moment, great. It's building, it's building. In the meantime, the Mexico field is unsafe to play on. We literally say, all right, we have two days to schedule a game back at the L.A. Coliseum. It's a Monday night football game. It's the biggest game of the week. All right, make it happen. So we're in the middle of all this adversity. Now we have to fly back with families, go to L.A., pull off a Monday night football game. The organization handed out all tickets to first responders and everyone that was going through fighting the wildfires, the tragedy, the shooting, everything that had gone on. So you couldn't buy tickets for this game. We fill the stadium. And we're in the middle of this, Ryan, it is one, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. This, the end score, I believe was 54 to 51. It was one of the most wild games I've ever been a part of, but having the crowd there, and these are people that are putting their lives on the line to go fight these wildfires. These are people that just lost family members. They're in the middle of this and we're sitting there playing a football game. And it just made me think when we were in Colorado, we got to do this, the steps. So we did the incline while we were there. And I'm thinking, in my head as I'm in the middle of this 30 minute climb, man, this is, all right, this is uncomfortable. Every time I started thinking about, there's people that just died in a mass shooting. There's people whose homes are gone. They're never gonna have their possessions again. And there's people going through life-changing things. And I'm worried about taking one step because my heart rate's a little bit high. Man, you wanna talk about perspective? And then this is one of the craziest parts. My family and I are taking our family Christmas photos that next week, Ryan, and we're in, we're at a local mall and we're doing the family picture thing. And it's just where we went every year. There was someone in line who had lost a family member in that mass shooting. They were picking up their family photos. They took these photos with a full family. They came in there and they're leaving to go back to a home where they don't have a full family. And you want to talk about perspective, whatever's going on in your life, whether you have health issues, whether you're just in a tough time, you get fired from a job, you know what? There's people going through a lot worse. So if you want to talk about the perspective and the empathy that you can have for just humanity, and I think we need this more than ever right now, because you think about the things that are going on in the world, 
those things led me to think about what's what's important one step after another if you're going through adversity it's still one step after another if things are going great it's one step after another if you don't change that process you just consist consistently move forward consistently you are going to be better at life in the end and along the way make sure you help somebody out because you don't know what they're dealing with what they're going through wow man uh thank you for sharing i know we went a little over but i really appreciate this that story all these stories um i had high hopes and expectations you just killed so i really appreciate it man especially in the middle of a game week i'm excited for you guys i've become an eagles fan uh when i wasn't didn't really care before but i've become one so i'm rooting hard for you guys i'm just really grateful for you man and i know that we're going to continue our dialogue as we both progress absolutely ryan i can't thank you enough man i'm grateful to be here appreciate you love it thanks dad thank you